Hey, this is Hunter with Lone Star Woodworking, and in this video, we're going to use this monster of a slab to build one of my nicest tables. Now, this build is a continuation on the dining table coffee table package that I'm making for a friend of mine that helped me out tremendously with my social media presence. And this slab came from, I think, the same area of California, but not the same supplier. Her coffee table slab came from a company called Cali Hardwoods and Supplies. They're really good people, really easy to work with, super responsive on Facebook Messenger, which is where I bought it from. Um, and they have a lot of really nice, really cool pieces of wood for really nice prices. And this slab came from a company called Tahoe Slab Furniture, and the owner, his name is Colin Davis. He had the opportunity to clear out this massive walnut orchard that has a bunch of these types of slabs or these types of trees on it. And I'm saying he's got hundreds of thousands, maybe that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but he's got a lot of these slabs to cut down. And he's got a mill, he's got a kiln, and he delivers nationwide. And now normally, a slab like this, that's got all of these really desirable traits, like that burl, the curl, the graft line, something like this in this size, would run run probably somewhere in the ballpark of 4,500, maybe 5,500, depending on who you bought it from. But we got this slab for $3,000, which I think is more than fair. I think it's a huge steal, but it's awesome that this guy has the opportunity to do this and then it benefits kind of everybody within our little woodworking community. And so I will be linking his socials and everything like that in the video description. If you've got a client that wants a table like this, he's the guy to go to. And he is super responsive, really nice guy. And he was honestly a lot of fun to work with. Now at the time that I was cutting this thing down to its rough dimensions, I had loaned out my track saw to a friend of mine who was trying to figure out if he wanted the Makita versus the Win versus going real big and buying the Festool or the Mafel. So I had to use a straight edge and my circular saw and clearly the blade was in dire need of a changing, but we got to cut down. Now the edge cleanup really wasn't that bad on the outside edges. There wasn't a whole lot of rotted wood and whatever little rotted wood there was, it was immediately taken off by this nylon wheel. And overall, that was probably the quickest portion of the slab cleanup, and normally it is. Now, this is the part that normally takes the longest, which is removing the bark inclusions and the softwood from the top of the slab, because you gotta sit there and dig into it. There's not a whole lot of room for you to really move around on the sides of it and kind of maneuver some of your other tools in there. So this part takes a little bit longer. But on this slab, it was really just that one area on that one side that needed that attention. So I spent, I think, maybe a total of 20 minutes doing that and I got everything out. But this center section had all of that rot. It was horrible. And I know I'm speeding it up a lot in this clip, but there was just so much dirt and dust and rot coming off of this every single time I would dig a little bit further in with some of my tools and then hit it with that nylon wheel, I just hit a new pocket of that rot. This took me probably close to about an hour and a half, maybe two hours of just digging in this crotch section to finally get everything that needed to come off, off. Now the melamine that I'm using for this epoxy pour is a reused piece, so there's plenty of tape still on there and I'm just taping up some of the areas of that exposed melamine just so I'm not damaging it and then knocking off any of the little epoxy puddles that are going to keep the slab from sitting perfectly flat in the form. Now when the client saw the shape of the table, she really liked the little live edges on the outside, the ones that kind of give it that hourglass shape. And I thought those looked pretty nice as well. And I thought it added a really unique shape to this already very unique slab. And so she asked if we could keep that. And I said, yes, absolutely. So I'm damming off everything here just so I can do a partial pour instead of you know an entire pour where those side sections are gonna get filled up with epoxy and there's gonna be epoxy leaking all under the bottom of the table. Not that that's any foreshadowing, but if you've watched my videos enough, you know it wouldn't be one of my videos without a screw up.
All right, y'all, so not like a super huge issue, um, but I ran out of packing tape. And obviously, I'm kind of Frankensteining this form together here because I've got more pieces of melamine right here that I'm gonna have to kind of stack uh, next to each other in order to build out an entire wall. But again, the problem is that my typical form release method of using packing tape, I, I just don't have any. I really don't feel like going to Home Depot and buying more because that's gonna take 20, 30 minutes out of my day and it's not much, but it's just something I don't wanna do. So, you've seen me do this before, but paste wax, right? Paste wax is a, a, a method of form release and it has worked. It didn't work the greatest whenever I did it the last time, but I think that's because I was inexperienced with it and now that I've gained a little bit more use with it, I think I can make this work just so I can save some time. So, we're gonna do that. Now, obviously, this isn't the big screw up that I'm talking about. And in fact, I'll go ahead and spoil this one for you. This worked out remarkably well. Um, and the last time I tried this was on my little Texas Ebony side table that I built before my son was born. And I don't think I used it right, or at least I don't think I used enough. And that's what kind of led to the semi failure of that one. Some of the pieces of the form stuck to the, the epoxy and kind of tore it up. So this time I was just going to use an excess of it, really coat everything and make sure that it wasn't going to stick. Now you might be looking at this and asking yourself, Hunter, why in the hell are you removing all of that caulking? Well, it was a little bit over a month between me caulking this thing initially and actually getting the epoxy in to make the pour. So I was really nervous about the integrity of the caulking leading up to that point, which in hindsight, that was kind of a ridiculous worry because, I mean, there's caulking around my house that's probably been here since it was built in 2017 that is still holding up just fine. So this was maybe a little bit of wasted effort, but it made me feel better in the end. And now I'm just making sure that absolutely every single seam is caulked up so that if I do have a leak, it at least won't be on the outside. Again, not that that's any foreshadowing. Now, like always before any pour, I'm going to just coat the sections that I think are going to be at risk of staining initially. I do actually end up uh, sealing this entire slab and kind of giving up after the screw up. But for right now, this is what I thought was just going to be necessary. Now, when it comes to measuring out my colorant for my epoxy, this is probably a bad practice, but I just, I don't really measure it. So I have a little metal stir stick in there and the way I measure if my epoxy is black enough for me to be satisfied with it is I pull that stir stick to the surface and if I can see the metal before it breaks the surface of the epoxy, then it's still not dark enough. So I just keep adding more and more dye until I can no longer see that stir stick before it comes up above the surface. Well, this sucks. Um... So basically, whatever the caulking trip I was trying to use, or trick that I was trying to use, it, it just, it didn't work. Um, there's caulk that failed right here. So there's a pool of epoxy. I drilled a few holes so that way it can empty into this bucket. That way I can at least save some of the epoxy. I tried damming everything off a bunch. It just really wasn't working out. That side's not any better. And I actually have to keep going back to that area with a cup and uh, pouring it into the bucket because every time I pour it over there, it just keeps seeping back over into that little area. So that kind of sucks, but the idea that I had that seems to be working is shim everything up on this side, force it all to flow over to this front end, and once that is at least a little bit set up, I'll take those off, pour the rest of these voids here, and then hopefully pour that one little area right over there. And after that, hopefully, will be good. So yeah, there's the big reveal of the screw up that I made. I just, for some reason that caulking didn't work and I, I keep blaming the caulking or at least the language that I'm using makes it sound that way. I know that it's 100% user error. 
But once I got everything dammed up and it had finally tacked up, I used my little brush there to make sure that it was actually tacky. And I've heard a few different ways to tell if your epoxy is ready for that chemical bond. Some say it's tacky, and by tacky, to me, that makes it feel like um, bubble gum whenever it's already been chewed. That's tacky to me, but that might also be a little too firm for epoxy to actually chemically bond in the best way. So the one that I've been following and the one that seems to be working for me the most is waiting until your epoxy is about the consistency of toothpaste. So kind of liquidy, but solid enough to hold its form if you need it to, something like that. Um, so that's kind of what I waited for and made the pour, everything went fine, but you can see that the one thing I was trying to prevent with that epoxy seeping underneath the slab totally failed, which I guess we're all not that surprised by it, but you know, it was still one of those things where I was holding out this really weird form of hope that it wouldn't be that bad. It was. So after I got the form busted off, it was time to take everything over to Algoa Millworks to get flattened. Now, there's going to be a different company opening up really close to me that has a machine that is similar to a slab miser. And if you don't know what that is, it's basically a machine that has a better cutting head for this kind of stuff. And it doesn't tear out the epoxy and wood nearly as bad. I love Corey, I love Algoa Millworks, they've been really good to me, and I'm still gonna continue to give them business, but their flattening services is something that I may start passing up on in favor of that cleaner cut, because it really does make a lot more work for me in the end. The only major pros to it is, one, I don't have to do the flattening myself and make a huge mess of my garage, Two, I know that it's actually perfectly flat and it's not going to be a little bit wobbly depending on if I could actually construct a workbench properly. So those two things are great. And those two things are some of the biggest reasons I go to Corey in order to actually flatten these things. But I do end up taking an entire day away from myself because I have to sit here and fix all of these little tear out areas and uh, on some of the softer pieces of wood, it definitely tears that out a whole lot more, which requires a whole lot more fixing. So that's just a, a thought of mine. The Lucas Mill is still definitely a good option for you if it's your only option. Just luckily for me, someone else is opening up shop with a nicer machine. Now I need everybody's opinion on this particular aspect of my builds because I think I am the only one that is putting out consistent content with this method of stabilizing a slab. Do you guys care to have that video? I know I've said, I think in like three or four videos, that I'm going to make a video on how to do this process, but I'm curious to hear from my more inexperienced audience. You know, do you think that I need to go more in depth on this process or can you see this kind of sped up version of it and figure it out for yourself? Because I will be honest, it is not a difficult process. And just watching this, I would hope that it's clear enough on how to do it. But I need everybody's opinion. So go ahead and drop a comment. Let me know, yes, I want the video or no, I don't need that video. This is just fine. Something along those lines. You don't have to say that exact thing. But that's just something that I wanted to put out there because I don't want to waste everybody's time on this section of the video if it's not something that you really care to see and learn about. However, the footage that occurs from me doing this whole process is very satisfying because watching the V-bar just lay in there perfectly flat just under the surface it, it's really satisfying to me every single time. So maybe that's kind of the fault here is I'm, I'm making videos with content that I think I would like and I don't think I've really done that great of a job of reaching out to the audience and asking you guys what you want. So this is kind of my attempt to start doing that. Now for the edge cleanup here, what you didn't see is that I got into straight up panic mode whenever the epoxy started leaking into those little hourglass uh, shaped live edges. And I put liquid nails, caulking, flex paste, 
anything that was remotely considered an adhesive and readily available in my shop, I put on those sides. So I had to take that angle grinder and really just get aggressive with that, that side cleanup because nothing else was going to take it off. Now this is kind of the tear out that I was talking about that occurs with that Lucas mill. It's just part of it. And I have seen and used water popping before, but I'll be honest, at one point I was only using water popping because that's what all of the other YouTubing woodworkers that I was watching were doing. And I thought, well, hey, if they're doing it, there's got to be something to it. And that's not an entirely incorrect thought process, but this is where that application actually has a physical reason. So the Lucas Mill had left those imprints or those indents and that tear out. And if you water pop it, it causes those kind of loose uh, wood fibers to stand up on end. And when you sand them off, it is supposed to get rid of some of those marks. And it did actually work for a little bit. But at some point, I did just have to sit there and keep going over it and over it and over it with 80 grit until everything finally came out. I was trying to be less redundant with my videoing so that way I don't show you guys things that you've seen a million freaking times uh, but in doing so I kind of forgot to start recording when I was doing something a little important. It's nothing extravagant, nothing particularly new but there were a lot of soft areas around the slab and you can kind of see it in that corner over there. It's absorbing a good amount of moisture or of the epoxy right now. So I wanted to stabilize all those soft areas so that way my sanding would be a little bit easier to do because those softer areas tend to get taken away a whole lot faster than the stable areas. So I'm doing that. Something just kind of important to note, if you're gonna do this, you need to seal the underside as well because the slab needs to absorb moisture at an equal rate on both sides, otherwise it'll cup. So I'm unfortunately at a stopping point for today with this. I'm gonna keep basting it over the next couple of hours, make sure everything is stabilized equally and get to it later. Once that epoxy dried, it was time to start sanding everything off. And it's really important to note that you have to sand off the sealed sides at the same time. You can't just unseal the top and then leave the bottom sealed because that's going to cause some issues for you later on. I know I kind of said that in my voiceover, but I feel like it's one of those very important things that's really easy to forget because it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. So with the soft areas stabilized, it was time to start sanding. I started sanding everything from 80 grit all the way up to 220 grit. When I got to 220 grit, I stopped and I put my roundovers on. Now this little router base plate thing that has the handle there, it is freaking awesome. It gives me so much more surface area to actually balance the router because I am really bad about accidentally tipping that router, especially when I do these corners. But with that extra surface area, this was like butter. It was so much easier. Once I put all of my roundovers on, I put a soft pad on my sander and 320 grit sandpaper on there and gave everything its final sanding. And you might be asking yourself if a soft pad is 100% necessary to sand the top. And the answer is no, but a soft pad, if you're not going to use your hands, pretty much is required to successfully sand these corners because you're really gonna mess up the proportions there if you don't use your hands or a gentler pad. Now, obviously we're already on to the finishing, but I really wanted to kind of just plug my perfect stamp this time. I was really, really happy with that one. And then yeah, at this point it was make or break. I wasn't entirely sure if I had done everything right. I know that there were a lot of things about this slab that were kind of unfamiliar to with uh, to me, such as this like super rotted area. I wasn't entirely sure if there was maybe going to be trap moisture because we've all seen videos where it has like these yellow whitish streaks and that means trap moisture in wood, but I went over it and over it and over it with three or four different kinds of moisture meters and each one of them was reading at like 
9%, which is well below what I would expect for it being in this area. So I used Rubio Monocoat, took 15 minutes, and then wiped off all the excess. And what I kind of showed you there, but kept sped up for some reason, was I'm using a white scotch bright pad after I get all of the excess off and buffing in that last little bit that might be left on there. And these were the pictures I sent to the client saying, hey, this thing looks so much nicer than I thought it would. Um, but she was happy with it. I was happy with it. I took it in kind of like the golden hour of um, our sunlight and it looked just gorgeous. And I'm going to kind of gloss over the attachment of the legs because I think we've all seen me attach legs to table bases a few too many times and it's a really, really simple process. Um, it's pretty much the same as attaching the, the angle iron. But these are the final pictures. I dragged it outside because we had a really nice sunny day. The table was looking gorgeous. Everything was looking good. The client's happy. I am now at a point where I am just waiting on them to come on down to Texas, pay me a visit. They're going to come pick it up. They're going to come bring their coffee table that had some issues with the delivery. And I'm going to fix that. That's unfortunately not going to be in this video, but keep an eye on my socials and I'll post everything there. So guys, if you made it this far, I really think you should consider subscribing because I make content just like this all the time. And that's going to do it for the video. So I hope you enjoyed. I hope you learned something and I hope to see you next time. See you.